rapture. I use one word, disappointment, for what happened in the metals market. That's an emotional response. So I think first we have to contrast, you know, what happened in the dollar and what happened primarily in the stock market. <clears throat> Gold is the anti-dollar investment. That's how most people think of it. There's a lot of merit to that statement. But primarily gold moves against the stock market. The stock market just kept making new highs. So you would think that gold would be making not necessarily new lows, but not do as well. And that's part of the equation. The other part was uh, what happened in the silver market. With the beginning of the year, with the Wall Street bets and some conversion factor of people that moved to Wall Street silver, and that effort grew substantially, especially in the early part of the year, and we saw a lot of pressure on the silver market <clears throat> in the early first quarter of uh, 2021. In fact, we got to, I think, 30. My prediction at the beginning of the year was looking for a $30 silver print. I, I thought it hit that. And uh, we might have hit it in the overseas market. I'm not sure, but we got fairly close. And then we saw two of the main uh, ETFs come out and change the prospectus, uh, the SLV and the SIL. LPR, I think it was. Anyway, the main one, SLV, and the other substantial ETFs both changed. In fact, in one of them, they stated that they were concerned about the physical silver supply being able to be maintained at a level that was commensurate with what the uh, ETF was supposed to hold. My words, that's kind of a paraphrase. And then a little bit later, the uh, CFTC uh, commissioner said they, you know, why they, they needed to tamp down the silver market. I mean, you never hear them talk about tamping down the soybean oil market or tamping down the cattle market or tamping down the corn market. So these things are very frustrating to silver investors, speculators. <clears throat> but nonetheless, that was what the first quarter looked like, and that was about the best. And through the rest of the year, uh, we started seeing you know the price fall off. And even mid-year or so, which the sell so even mid-year, the summer doldrums took place, which is very expected by most of us that have been in the market for a while. So that didn't really concern me. I did think after the summer, we would start to see a push up. And I was still optimistic that we might even get back up in the $30 range. And of course, I couldn't have been more wrong. I mean, a lot of uh, analysts such as myself felt, thought the same way. There were a lot of technicals that looked good. The COT looked uh, favorable. There were you know, room to the upside. We saw the largest silver purchases physically in 2020. It seemed we were getting the same demand for investment in 2021. So there are fundamental and technical factors to be optimistic after the summer doldrums, but it failed. So I'm not trying to make excuses. I have a couple of critics on Twitter, and I've got more other places that you know, no one's owning this. I'll own it. You know, it's frustrating also knowing that we've expanded the money supply at such an unbelievable rate. And yet gold itself and silver both have not really responded to this massive influx of what I call funny money into the system. And of course, this flows, you know, a lot of it goes into the debt markets, the credit markets with the U.S. bonds. A lot of it flows into the stock market and a lot of it's uh, static. It's it's held, it's sterilized, it just sits on the bank's balance sheets and doesn't do anything. So it's almost as if it hasn't been printed because it just sits there basically doing nothing other than you know, lying on the ground dead. That's a metaphor, of course. So for 2022, uh, I do think we will see better markets. But with the Fed taking a stronger stance and talking about tapering and raising interest rates, that will be a negative for gold and silver going forward for a while. But at the same time, China is lowering their interest rates. And this has happened a couple times in the past. And what this means is since China and the U.S. are the largest economies in the world, with China cutting rates at the same time the U.S. is raising rates, that can't go on very long. And once the market recognizes that the U.S. is more or less bluffing, or they've done a raise or two, and they can't go any further. That in the past has shown to be the bottom in gold. And from there, there's been pretty massive rallies. 2016 being a prime example. 
In fact, in 2016, we had such a huge rally from January to through September, which passed the summer doldrums, which is very rare. I was convinced at that time that the new bull market was intact. It was, I was looking back, obviously, I was incorrect, but it certainly was a moneymaker for us at the Morgan Report. We had uh, AG <clears throat> First Majestic on in January at a very low level. I think we made about 600% on that one stock um, because you know we had such a good rally in the silver and gold markets. So what I'm saying is I think we have to be a little more patient. I think 2022 is not going to be that good for gold initially. But I think going in, as I just outlined, there'll be that bottom that we've seen two times before, and then we'll start to get a rally, and I think we will rally at the end of the year. So next year at this time, I think we'll be pretty happy about what gold and silver performance has been. And last but not least, I haven't said it in a while, the black swans flying around. I think you should always have a position, maybe not overweight. You might want to overweight slightly when we hit the bottom, if my thesis is correct. And otherwise, um, just maintain what you have. Don't stress. I mean, it's, you know, it's God's money. It's a sure thing. It's certainly not a speculative investment like a cryptocurrency. And if you're weighted correctly and you have the right amount, you really can sleep at night. You don't have to stress. It's people that over, over invest or have uh, expectations that are, let's say, not realistic with what the money powers are able to achieve at this time. Now, looking back at 2021, I think the silver squeeze was probably, it may have been the biggest event in the silver market since the 1980s. Um, and we did see a huge rally and up to almost $30. I recently interviewed Robert Keynes of Gold Silver Pros, and he said that um, essentially, given the silver supply right now, the silver market can't really handle another squeeze without having the price go significantly higher. Your perspective on that? That's a tough one. First of all, shout out to Robert. He's a great guy and has some very good insights. Uh, I've seen, uh, you know, I've watched this for years, probably longer than anybody, maybe Ted Butler and I are, you know, the longest hawks. Uh, you know, hawk meaning <laughs> looking with beady eyes at the CO2 reports and the inventories. But I've seen the uh, registered category down as low as 35 million ounces before we got a significant rally. And right now we're at 100 million. But Robert's correct from the aspect of the flow rate. So it doesn't matter too much of what the inventory amount is. It depends on how much is being, you know, siphoned off. It's like flow through a pipe. If you've got a you know, garden hose and it's trickling out, and that's how much silver demand there is. Or if you've got a fire hose and it's gushing out and it can hardly hold the pressure, you've got a different dynamic. So by putting words in Robert's mouth, but if you're in that fire hose situation, then yeah, we haven't got much to go. And that would be true for 2020. Uh, that's what happened. In 2021, it remains to be determined what the final numbers are. But Halfway through the year, it looked as if we were in the fire hose situation. If we were, then the price really makes no sense. And if that is to occur or is occurring, then I'll agree with them that, you know, we have a, a situation that cannot be held back for very long. It all comes down to supply and demand and supply being verified. I, you know, one thing I haven't brought up too much, although I've done it on my personal podcast, I call the Weekly Perspective. You know, and Morgan Stanley got caught for, you know, selling silver that, that, that they didn't even sell and storing it, and it wasn't a storage facility. They didn't get in that big of trouble. I mean, for me, you know, personally, I think anyone that cheated that much and lied should be banned from ever trading in the silver market again for the rest of the firm's, you know, tenure. That's not what happened. They paid a fine. But when they also made the excuse that it was – it was ordinary and customary in the storage market to do that. In other words, they were justifying that, you know, taking people's money to buy silver and not really buying silver and not even storing it was pretty much, I'll say, standard practice. And that is, you know, it's in print. It's in Coin Week. Is it true or false? I don't know. I have it in print. I can show you the source. It's one source. It doesn't prove it exactly. But what I am saying 
is from my vast experience, there have been numerous times where people have bought silver, and, and it happens in gold as well, but primarily in silver, paid for it, paid storage, and really it's not commensurate with um, A equals A, which means there's a lot of people doing the same thing, but they're running a fractional reserve system. So yeah, there's silver there, and yeah, it's in a vault, but it's only, let's say, 50% of the fiat uh, that was put into the system to back it up. And why? Because they can get away with it. Because most people that buy and hold it trust their broker, their account, their vault, whoever it is. And I'm not calling out any of the big names. I think you're safe with, you know, Brinks or Garda or Loomis or, you know, any of the CFTC warehouses. I think you're safe in all of those. I'm talking about, <clears throat> let's say, some of these other ones. And even our mainstream brokerage house, I mean, it's proven that Morgan Stanley lied. So you got to be a little careful. So my point is that if every ounce of silver that was bought, paid for, and stored was actually there, I think you'd have a much tighter silver supply than you have. There's so many ways for these banks to hold it in their vaults, but for the uh, counterparties to be able to leverage that, use it as collateral, and produce, let's say, a derivative product that really obfuscates the true dynamics of the physical silver market and gold and platinum and palladium for that matter, but primarily the silver market. And I know with respect to a lot of the, I guess you could say manipulation or uh, controls in the silver market, uh, it, you know, there has been proven manipulation, obviously, or, you know, banks have settled for manipulation cases. But your perspective then on is Basel III going to have any impact on this? Because I know at the beginning of the year, some of the uh, regulations are going to be implemented. So do you, some people are hoping that, that this will kind of clear up the market. If, uh, But what is your perspective on that? It'll have almost zero effect. I've been through this before. I reread it. Uh, it's been misunderstood. It's pretty easy to look. Investopedia does a pretty good blurb on what Basel III really means. What it will do is it will deleverage the market somewhat. It will take a lot of, of some of the trading desks on, you know, brokerage firms will just cancel their gold trading desk altogether. The volume will go back to probably the futures exchanges and the risk will be mitigated from the banks. So the banks will put that risk on the individual trading trader or the, uh, again, the futures exchange or maybe someone else in the over-the-counter market. 